Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, good morning and good evening to everyone who will be watching this uh, through YouTube. So today our teaching is from John chapter 12, verse 24 to 27. Okay. So let's read this passage first. It says, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serve me, the father will honor him. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say, Father? Save, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came. Okay. For this purpose I came to this hour. So I picked up this passage uh, because uh you know, it is one of the few uh, many times in the book of John where Jesus starts a teaching with truly, truly. And uh, this phrase, truly, truly, it occurs like 25 times in the book of John. But uh, it is unique to this book. Uh, in other gospels, it doesn't occur twice. It only it occurs only once. So I, I found that like an interesting difference in the in this book. So <clears throat> truly, truly, I mean, of course, Jesus is emphasizing like what he's going to, to say now is uh, very important and he's emphasizing and telling us to pay attention and uh, to listen to it uh, quite carefully. So in verse 24, he is comparing uh, us, us to like a wheat, a grain of wheat, and uh, we are a grain of wheat and our, uh, you know, if we are to bear fruit, uh, we cannot bear fruit if we are alone. Uh, and meaning if we are abiding alone, but if we fall into the earth and die, like in the typology, if we fall into the earth and die, we can become something which is uh, very, very useful and something which is, which glorifies God uh, you know, as uh, someone who is very fruitful and bearing fruit for God. So how do we, uh, as a wheat, not abide alone? And the typology here is that we need to uh, fall into the earth, you know, and die. And otherwise we abide alone or we are kind of... Uh, you know, not useful. Uh, we will we will not bear fruit to God. And this phrase, abiding alone, it occurs also in John chapter 10. And there, I think we get a better picture of what it means as a grain of wheat to fall into the earth and die. And in John chapter, sorry, in John chapter 15, it says that in order to not abide alone, uh, we, sh we should be abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, in this, in this uh, passage in John chapter 15, verse 4, it says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burnt. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, 
ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you so we need we uh, we need as a branch we cannot bear fruit on our own and we are useless you know uh, in terms of uh, our purpose and our uh, and our uh, you know goal in this life like we can we will be useless and in this in this passage it is as it is saying as if you know just like a branch that is not bearing any fruit is useless and all it is fit to is uh, to be thrown away and cast into the fire and that would be you know something that we do not want our life to be you know I, we don't want our life to be fruitless uh, so <clears throat> the only way we can bear fruit to god and and be prosperous is that we do not abide alone but we abide in jesus christ uh, who is the wine so uh, so when we compare john chapter 12 and verse 15 you know they are similar verses so in this case jesus is like the wine and we are the branches and in john chapter 12 jesus is like the earth uh, and the earth is uh, you know when a seed falls into the earth it is kind of very miraculous of how a seed uh, miraculously transforms and becomes into this huge tree who is which is very useful and fruitful so similarly we also uh, would be like that you know if we die to ourselves and we abide in Jesus Christ who is our master and are faithful to him uh, we will also become a very fruitful and prosperous tree and in verse 7 uh, also it tells us that to abide in Jesus is the same as to abide in his word so we abide in Jesus if we are uh, learning his teachings and his commandments and we are uh, faithfully obeying it in our lives. Uh, that is how we would be abiding in Jesus Christ and not being alone. <clears throat> A good example is in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 where Paul says that he died to his old life but he now lives in, uh, but now Jesus Christ lives in him. So in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and delivered himself for me. So Paul, uh, in, in metaphorically, he died to his old life of uh, being you know, he was, he lived a very different life before he met Jesus Christ. Uh, he was probably obeying all the, you know, rituals of the Juda Judaic uh, old covenant. Of course, he did not let go of everything, but many things he had to let go of. Uh, and uh, he was very happy to do that. And he, in fact, says that those things I counted as useless or dung. So, so the same is with us. When we are, uh, when we are abiding in Jesus Christ, when we are being faithful to His commandments, uh, we first need to also die to our old life. And there are many things uh, we did before we knew Jesus Christ and before we knew His teachings uh, that we need sh we should die to, uh, just like Paul did. So he not only died to his old life, but now he says Christ lives in me. So. <clears throat> that is what it means, right? That we abiding in Jesus Christ and Jesus abiding in us means that Christ lives in us. And it means that we are living a life uh, just like Jesus Christ lived. And he lived a life of faith and obedience uh, to God, right? He, he was doing the will of the Father and uh, he did not come uh, to do his own will. So, so we have this... Uh, you know, example in Paul, which we also should imitate when we uh, die to our own self. Then in the next verse, it says, he who loves his life lose, loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. So again, verse 25 is like 
it, it is elaborating more on verse 24, where it, the, uh, the typology was a seed. When it uh, comes in contact with the ground, it dies. Uh, in verse 25, it is explaining to us in a different way, where it's saying that we should not, we, uh, we should not love our life, but actually hate it. So what does it mean to hate our life? In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, it tells, it kind of gives an, an idea of, you know, what it means to hate our life. And it has to do with priorities. Like we do not uh, put ourselves first and what we like and, you know, what uh, our uh, ambitions or aims are. That should not be our priority uh, when we are abiding in Jesus Christ and when we have died to our own, own self. So in Luke 14, verse 26, it says, if anyone come, comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So what does it mean to ha uh, hate? It means to, that we don't give them priority. Uh, of course, uh, of course, like uh, yeah, it, you know, it doesn't mean, and actually, we we are hating people around us. It just means that we are uh, we love God more than the people around us, and we love God more than even our own desires. Um, it means that God is first, and God is number one. And uh, it is interesting that the it is also comparing, you know. Uh, not only hating our own life, but also uh, our loved ones and the people around us. And of course, in those cultures, you know, they, they are family ties and their uh, commitment to their family members was much, much higher uh, in, the, in those cultures. You know, they, they would never, it, uh, it, it would be very, very hard to go against your father, uh, this, uh, you know, the leader of your, uh, of your family or even the leader of your tribe or group it was it was very hard because it would be uh, you would be persecuted uh, big time so <clears throat> jesus is really uh, calling for uh, a very high level of commitment so that's the reason you know uh, it's it looks upon it is looked upon as even hating uh, the people around us so when we also when we, uh, wh whom do we obey first, right? So if we are obeying people uh, more than God, then we are not, uh, you know, hating, hating them, right? We are telling them that, uh, that they are more important than God. So God comes before our parents. Uh, God comes before all our loved ones and even And even our own life. So to hate our own life means that our life is not the priority, but Jesus Christ and God is the priority. The parallel passage of this verse is in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So here we see that instead of hate, it says deny. So we deny obedience, uh, you know, to ourselves when our own passions and our own desires uh, go against God and his word. So that is what it means to deny ourselves. And we take up the cross and we follow uh, and take up his cross and follow me. Verse 25, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. So here, instead of love, it says save. For whoever, whosoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. For what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, 
and will recompense every man according to his deeds. So, so here, saving our life is synonymous with you know, loving our own life. And, and the key word here is also that we, are, uh, we love our life and we are trying to save our life by gaining the whole world. So what does it mean to gain the whole world? Uh, it would mean that we are, you know, loving the, the things of this world and what this world has to offer more than God. And we, when we do that, uh, we are saving our own soul. We are saving our life in this world. And if we do that, the warning is that uh, we will not be recompensed in a positive way. The key word also here is recompense. Uh, if we love this world at the cost of uh, not obeying the Father and uh, not uh, following Jesus Christ, when the Son of Man comes in the glory of the Father, we will not be recompensed uh, in a positive way. You know, we will not be rewarded. And whatever we have gained in this life is not going to help us uh, in the day of judgment. In, in Luke, in Luke chapter 12, it tells us, you know, what does it mean to, uh, to gain this world? It, it says in verse 15, Jesus says, and he said unto them, beware and be on your own, on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist in his possessions. So to gain the whole world here is to be greedy, you know, and uh, just to be focused on trying to obtain things uh, much more than what we need uh, to be selfish and excessive. And greed can come in different forms. Uh, greed is not just wealth and things and possessions, but greed also is when we are greedy for power and we are greedy for recognition and uh, honor from other people and all these other things that we can get in this life, right? So, so we need to die to greed. We need to when we uh, say, when we are not you know saving ourselves in this world, we are denying greed and we are uh, uh, we are trusting God and being content with what we have. So Jesus goes on to explain more, and we can read this story. It says, and he told them a parable, saying, "The land of a certain rich man was very productive, and he began to reasoning." And he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my cro crops? And he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And then there I will store all my grains and my goods. And I will save, say to my soul, soul, you have many good goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. So this is, this passage Notice how many times the word I, 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 I is mentioned. So this man was totally obsessed with his own, you know, plans and purposes, right? In so much that he was not rich towards God, you know, and uh, that is the key here that we are, we should be focused in our actions, in whatever we do, you know, whatever our endeavors are. Uh, we should be focused and ask ourselves question like, will this please God or uh, will this glorify God? And uh, will I be recompensed, right, properly in the day, in that day? Or is this something that 
will not give me a good recompense in that day. And also, I believe that storing up things in itself probably is not wrong. I mean, because I know jo we know Joseph, right? He did he did something similar. He was building big big barns and he was storing up things, but that was perfectly in the will of God. Uh, that was something that he knew God had told him to do. So, of course, these things in the, in itself probably is not uh, is not you know sin in itself, but the motives, like why are we doing this? You know, is this going to please God and glorify God, or are we just doing it for our own greed uh, and for our own benefit, thinking that uh, we can live a better life in this world in future? So, so that is what this man was doing. His whole purpose was so that he can, for many years, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. So, so this is this was this was the problem. He was not denying himself uh, of this greed that he was in. Then moving on, you know, Paul called this way of lifestyle of greed uh, as human motives. In First First Corinthians fifteen verse thirty one, Paul said, "I protest, brethren, by the boasting." in you, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. That means he doesn't live like this. You know, he doesn't live uh, just for this world and just for, uh, you know, having his needs met in this life so that he can have an easy life because he says, I die daily. If from human motives, I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So Paul calls uh, this kind of, uh, you know, saving your life in this world lifestyle as human motives. And this is something that he willingly chose not to do. You know, he could have done that. That's what he's saying, that I could do that. But I chose to die daily. Uh, I chose to do that because I had great, you know, value on the recompense uh, that is there ahead of me, uh, which will be at, res at the resurrection. <clears throat> In James, you know, these are called wrong motives. In James chapter 4, verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures so it's very interesting like we can we can judge what we are asking for uh, in one sense and are we just asking for things because uh, we want to have pleasure in this world and save our life in this world and not deny ourselves and uh, and be obedient to jesus christ and be uh, you know busy doing his will so, so we can, uh, so these are wrong motives, right? That we should avoid and we should die to these things uh, so that we can live for Jesus Christ. So how can I know that I don't have the wrong attitude and whether I have really died uh, to myself, you know, in terms of the pleasures of this world? In Matthew 6, 25, I think this is a good test. It says, for this reason, I, I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor for your body. As to what you shall put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So some we can know whether we have died to ourselves and whether we are abiding in Jesus Christ, you know, if we are not anxious uh, and worried about these physical needs that we have. And uh, that is what Jesus is teaching here, that we should not be anxious for these things. Then Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. 
each day has enough trouble of its own. So we are not only to worry about, not worry about, you know, the physical needs of our, that we have, but we are also not to be worried about the future. Uh, you know, what is going to ha be ha going to happen and uh, we can get anxious. And when we are having anxieties like that, you know, we have not died to ourselves and we are not one with Jesus Christ and uh, we are not living by faith. So, so, so we should, I mean, die to ourselves and, and be joined to God and, and uh, have this attitude. So Philippians 4 verse 6, we are not to be anxious for physical things, but Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 that we should be anxious for nothing, right? And uh, we could be anxious for many things, you know, and get uh, be fretful about many things. So, but here it kind, kind of is uh, saying that we should be not, we should not be anxious for anything. So Philippians 4 verse 6, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So, so this is such an important uh, you know, principle uh, that we have. And of course, the next verse says that then the peace of God will be, will be with us. Then the next verse in John 12 is 20, uh, verse 26 is, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Again, verse 26 is giving us this, the same teaching of dying to ourselves. And it is explaining even more that dying to, dying to self and becoming one with Jesus Christ is the same as following Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, the picture here is, is how the sheep follow the shepherd, you know, uh, in John chapter 10. Uh, the, in John chapter 10, uh, it's a whole parable about the sheep. And uh, the sheep they are, you know, a very interesting group of uh, animals. They are like completely dependent on their on their master. Uh, they cannot survive on their own. Uh, if they, they if they don't have a master to take care of their, them, they will die in in few few years. They are, and uh, that means that they depend on their master for their food, for their nurture, for their care and for for their uh, protection you know they don't come to know if some there is a danger or uh, something is going to harm them so it's a good good picture of how we are right and of course david also said that god is his shepherd and he is like god's sheep so it's a very beautiful picture that uh, uh, that we can remember that that uh, when we die to ourselves, we have become like sheep and Jesus is our master and we are following him everywhere. Then the sheep here to follow Jesus Christ is also to hear his voice. And we know to hear his voice means uh, also that we obey his voice. So, so we always will be obeying Jesus Christ in everything if we have died to ourselves. And we also have a great promise if we are faithful in following Jesus Christ and obedient and we are obedient to him, the father will honor, you know, will honor, honor us. And this is such a great promise. I mean, uh, can you imagine being honored by God? I, mean, I can't imagine how it must be, uh, you know, to be honored by the father. So, it's a great promise that we can hold on to, uh, which can encourage us to be faithful to Jesus Christ. Then in Matthew 4, verse 19, to follow Jesus Christ is also uh, to be fishers of men, which means that we are discipling other people. You know, we are helping other brethren the best we can to become mature 
and uh, and uh, become good disciples of Jesus Christ. So, so we are bearing fruit, you know, other people to become faithful. <clears throat> then in verse 27, Jesus is telling us to die to ourselves and to, you know, bear fruit to God. But he just doesn't tell us he himself did that and he is our example. So he is also, you know, showing us and we can see how he did it. Because in verse 27, it says, now my soul has become troubled. So just like we experience, you know, hardships, griefs and problems, Jesus Christ also experienced those. and probably. Uh, he experienced it much, much more than what we go through because in this context, he was about to be uh, tortured and crucified, right? So he says, my soul has become troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But he says, like, should I, should I tell God to uh, save me, like uh, to deliver me and, not, and help me not to get go through all this? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. So basically, he's saying, no, uh, this is the will of the Father. And uh, I am willing to die to myself and to be obedient to the Father. So he is a great example you know, uh, in our life and we should imitate him. In Mark chapter 14, again, uh, it is the same uh, same situation and it says and he said to them my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death i mean that is some grief to go through huh? uh, and we know i think in another account it says he was sweating uh, sweating like drops of blood so he was going through some deep uh, troubles right my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death remain here and keep watching so he was Thought in prayer and trusting in God, you know, and we can learn from that. When we go through hardships and troubles, uh, we can also do the same. Verse 35, and he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass by, pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for thee. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what thou will. So we see the faith of Jesus Christ. He is, he in it, he is saying, you know, God, everything is possible with you. So he knew that God can deliver him, and uh, everything is possible with God. Uh, so he was showing, you know, great faith in God even in his time of suffering and testing. He was completely trusting in God. And uh, that is what gave him the power to go through the cross, right? Because he knew that the father would strengthen him and his father would help him go through the, uh, you know, the, the, the crucifixion and then be victorious uh, after that. So even in that situation, he was showing confidence to God and he was bearing fruit, right? This is the fruit that glorifies God. <clears throat> so we have Jesus as our example and we, we are looking to him, you know, as an example, right? And we also uh, want to be like him where we are dying to our own selves and obeying the father in all circumstances. In Philippians 3 verse 10, this is what uh, Paul's desire and prayer was. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. So Paul wanted to be conformed to his death. That mean, conform means similar or identical uh, to his death. 
in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it, nor have already become perfect, but I press on, in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. So Paul was pressing on, you know, in dying to himself, like just like Jesus Christ did, uh, and uh, being obedient and bearing fruit for God, just like Jesus Christ did. And we see here that this is something that uh, we all are growing in. That that means that it's a daily thing that we do. You know, we all uh, are, have not attained uh, fully. It is like a process. And we are continuously learning this more and more, looking at the life of Jesus Christ and his teachings. And we are continuously applying this in our life and we are pressing forward, uh, just like Paul did. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31, we already read this, but this is a daily, uh, daily thing that Paul was doing, you know, and we can also do that uh, so that we are always growing and becoming more and more uh, conformed to the death of Jesus Christ, more and more living, not for this world, but for the world to come. So, we can be unfruitful as, as God's children. You know, we can uh, not be that seed which is bearing much fruit. And we see this taught to us in Matthew chapter 13. It says, and the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky place, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporarily it's only temporary and when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. Or in King James, it says he gets offended. So if we do not die to ourselves, we will not have root and we will not bear fruit uh, to the father. You know? And uh, though we have received the word and maybe we have uh, accepted it, but if we don't die to ourselves, that means we don't put our own, uh, you know, wrong uh, ambitions aside and, and become one with Jesus Christ and obey him, uh, we will not bear fruit for, for the Father. So, so when we see, we see here that this person gets offended, he's not able to bear fruit because the person gets offended when trials and testing comes. And we learn here, like, you know, trials and testing, that is the time we can actually bear fruit and glorify God, you know. And that is the time we, we it is like the best time for us, you know, to, to bear fruit for God and be, be faithful. But, but sadly, that is the time we kind of uh, get offended, right? And uh, we are not bearing fruit. So we should not get offended. And when we are getting offended, you know, by trials and testings, uh, it shows that we have not died to ourselves, right? That uh, we are still living for our own self and we are not. So we can ask ourselves question, you know, how easily do I get offended? Uh, something... Uh, Something goes off that I had not planned for, you know, some minor testing comes, something, someone doesn't treat me well, or, you know, some small thing happened. Do I get offended? Uh, do I behave in a way which is not glorifying God? Do I stop, you know, following God? Uh, that, that would show that if we have died for ourselves or not, died to ourselves or not. In Psalm 119, 165, this is a great verse. It says, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. So to not get offended, we should love the law. And the law is, of course, the word of God, the scriptures and all his commandments, his precepts. Uh, if we love the law, 
that will protect us from not getting offended. So what does it mean to love the law? I would say, if we love the law, we will take the time to learn it, right? That would be the first step to, to show that we love the law. Uh, we would be reading it, we, will be, we would be memorizing it, and uh, it would be, we, would do, we would be doing all that we can to understand it properly. And we would be submitting to it, we will be obedient to it, uh, and uh, you know that is how we, we, we would show love, love for the word of God. Also, we would be, hold ourselves accountable to the word of God. Uh, we would judge ourselves based on the word of God. And that's when we do that, you know, when we hold ourselves uh, accountable to something which is higher, like the word of God, we will not get offended when people tell us something or, you know, they don't like us or things like that would become rather small to us, right? Because we are already holding ourselves accountable to the word of God. So this is such a great verse, and, uh, and I think uh, we learn a lot from this verse that how we can not get offended when trials and testing comes, but still bear fruit uh, to, the, uh, to God. In closing, uh, let's read Colossians chapter 3. So in Colossians chapter 3, it teaches us that we can have a risen life now, right? Uh, we can live the life of the coming kingdom like we heard last Sunday now. And of course, to do that, to be risen, we, we first need to die. You know, that's the big thing. Uh, we cannot be risen. If, so let's read this passage in Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So uh, we can experience a risen life uh, now. I mean, that's, that's so great, right? We can live the kingdom life now. So this is something not in future because in future, of course, the kingdom life we would not be seeking because it will be there because it, because it says here, keep seeking the things above. So in future, this kingdom will come and we will not be seeking it in that sense. But now we are seeking it by faith uh, and we can live by faith. Uh, you know, if we have died to ourselves now, uh, we can live this life now. Then in verse two, set your mind on things above not on the things that are on the earth. Again, this is something we can do now because in future we know that the heavenly things will be revealed and this is something that we don't need to pursue, but right now we can. Verse, verse three, for because, for because, or because you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So verse 3 again is important. It, we can have a risen life only if we have died now, like to our old life first, right? And, and uh, if we have died then to our old life, then our perspective is different, you know. Uh, we are looking at this life from a heavenly perspective. And notice that this life is right now hidden. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. So it is not uh, completely revealed right now. Uh, it is something that we all do in our personal life. You know, we die to ourselves. But, uh, but on that day, it will be revealed. Like, you know, those who will be recompensed greatly uh, those who will be those who actually had died in uh, to their own self in this life, you know they, that day it will not be hidden. That day it will be uh, re uh, revealed, and the Father will glorify them and uh, honor them openly. So what a great promise uh, and what a great blessing! You know if we uh, if we obey Jesus Christ and 
die to ourselves and uh, and uh, live for him so that's all i had for this teaching let me Did Rudy lock up? Hello. Uh, oh, there you are. You're back. Okay, when did I drop, John? Uh, right after you said I'm done with this teaching. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, Dustin, please go ahead. I think your hand is up. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Excellent. Hey, thank you for your sharing. I appreciate that. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised at all the different ways in which repentance type language is redefined as this dying to self. Um, I was interesting in this passage you brought up a couple of times, this one in 1 Corinthians 15, 31. Um, and it's funny, I, I stepped away for a second uh, and I came back and you were commenting on the verse. So I don't know if you actually uh, made this particular point, but in that passage, uh, Paul combines the fact that he dies daily with also, also the fact that he has fought wild beasts at Ephesus. You know the passage I'm talking about? So that um, yes. now here's something that's interesting. Uh, the that that phrase fighting wild beasts at ephesus that is a very common metaphorical phrase uh shared in the first century by greek and latin writers to mean having strong heated debates about truthful topics it's not about fighting animals in the gladiatorial ring of which there of course isn't one in ancient ephesus um and so I, I'm curious, uh, and I'm, I'm just now starting to think about this, what is the connection between dying to self, dying daily, and also this metaphor of uh, fighting wild beasts, which really is just a metaphor of uh, standing up for truth uh, in engaging in other persons in dialogue and debate, uh, often in fierce debate. Uh, do you have any kind of uh, thoughts on that? Yes, uh, Dustin, I, I, would, I was thinking that in Ephesus, yes, he had a lot of oppositions from the leaders there, you know, where they were causing riots and things to, to uh, I think they were, uh, because he was preaching against the goddess of that city, I think Diana. So I used to think that it relates to those people as wild beasts uh, because they were so, you know, antagonist towards Paul and they were causing him so much of problems there. So I used to think it, it is referring to those people. That's a good question, Dustin. Um, that uh, that you know, that's something I think to really think about because uh, you know, there's certainly a tendency for I think most people to shy away from you know confrontation over truth, over the gospel, you know, things like that, over um, you know important doctrinal divisions. You know, it's, it's critical. I'm, I'm going to call it critical doctrinal divisions, things like that. 
Um, and I, I, I hadn't thought about that, what Paul says there in First Corinthians uh, that way either. So it's a good question. I'm going to have to think about it as well. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking. Yeah, I think that. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll just say this last thing and then I'll be quiet. Um, it's interesting. And I think Rudy is right that the, the fierce discussions that took place um, were with non-Christian uh, persons in leadership in Ephesus. This is not Paul fighting with the church of Ephesus or with other Christians in Ephesus. Uh, this is. Uh, defending the truths of Christianity and of Jesus uh, and of the resurrection and the kingdom of God. And it, it's interesting that uh, I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at some of the other language that Paul used, like I, I, that passage in uh, Colossians 3 uh, is, is certainly built upon things that Paul said in Romans 6, where uh, dying with Christ is something that is, uh, obviously something that takes place, but it's symbolically enacted through the sacrament of water baptism uh, to where the outcome is that as you come about the water imitating the resurrection of Jesus, you are walking in newness of life. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out that it, it, dying to self is just part of it. You know, it's, it's, it's not dying to self to where you're dead and you're doing nothing. It's like you're dying to yourself so that you can walk in newness of life so that you can seek the things that are above so that you can seek first the king of god it's a uh, it's it's in a sense of changing your mind and repenting so that you can do something more so you could do something better so you could do something that is um in fulfillment of the will of god and at least for paul i think partially the fact that he is an apostle and that god had purposes for him that are not exactly the same as everybody else, but um, certainly his words are meant to inspire uh, imitation. Um, the, the act of dying to self involves a newness of life that for Paul was demonstrated by having these, these fierce discussions and debates about truthful Christian matters um, with non-believers, uh, those that I guess would be philosophically elite to whom uh, Paul would stand as a uh, a worthy dialogue partner. So anyway, I just, I haven't thought about this much. So this is me kind of like thinking off the top of my head, trying to put these things together. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Paul just kind of gives that little comment on it in first Corinthians 15, um, almost as like a footnote because it doesn't really deal with resurrection primarily. So we have to kind of put pieces together and speculate. And I just wanted to speculate out loud. Thank you, Dustin. Kenny? Saying something. Yeah, Rudy, thank you for putting this together. Really good stuff. Uh, this is, I think, you know, one of the, the kind of core parts of Christianity is, you know, dying to self and um, living for God in his ways instead. Um, and kind of as you, you mentioned, you kind of touched on this, um, you know, if we've got something going wrong in our life, negative, you know, being selfish or, um, you know, there's like a lot of things that we can do, basically putting ourselves first. Um, I, I would almost say like the root of most sins is probably a self-centeredness or a self first rather than a dying for self and living for God. So as I just kind of think about, you know, all the problems that mankind gets into, you know, stealing or lusting or coveting or you know all the all these different sins and problems most of them the root of it is a self-centeredness and a self-focus rather than a dying to self um so i think you know to a large degree if someone's got something in their life that they're not happy with and they realize it's something they need to repent of and move away um that's what needs to happen is a, a dying to self and a rather living for god and putting god's ways in his um things first so i think it's just kind of a core part of christianity and following jesus is to stop making it about ourselves and to start making it about the lord jesus and god and their ways and um, when we truly do that that's where you know things will really start to turn in our lives but 
Um, I see a lot of people that they say like, oh, I want to stop doing this bad thing, but they're not replacing it with the living for God part. They're just trying to, for their own selfish reasons, almost trying to stop doing something that they see as harming themselves. Um, but it's almost like a twofold thing. You have to stop doing the harmful thing, but you have to replace it with doing the healthy thing, which is loving God and loving others. So just really good stuff. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate you putting it together. Thank you, Kenny. Let me stop the recording so that it's not too long. Okay, if you are listening to this, thank you for uh, listening to this message and please join us if you would like to and contact us on Allegiance to the King website and we will send you the details. Thank you. <laughs>